everyone giving it the the 10 seconds as we jump on here for our live um wanted to just say uh good morning and good afternoon to everybody uh, i'm currently in maui right now so i'm getting up a little early today just want to definitely stay um consistent with these lives so i got a little bit of my maui background going on today um but i can see people are starting to come onto the platform so thank you so much um if you can give me the warm and fuzzies and just let me know i can see numbers but i can't see you or see names so um, as you come onto the platform just say hello make sure that i'm not talking to myself that's always that's always a good first moment for us so what i want to do is let's just take a few moments to do a quick recap of the video yesterday and so yesterday uh we covered an inclusivity question uh, it's an important question. It's one of many inclusivity questions. Um, good to see you. Um, one of many inclusivity questions that will potentially pop up in your leadership and Googling this interview. And so, you know, a couple of the other questions that we've seen. Hi, everybody. Thanks for thanks for coming in. Um, we've seen inclusivity questions. So this one, what do you do when somebody's being left out? Obviously, an inclusivity question. We've also seen the question coming up a lot recently of what do you do or sorry, tell me about a time a program or project or initiative was enhanced because of inclusivity. That's another very, very common question that's popping up. So um, just a couple of questions to keep in mind. But remember, with inclusivity, whether it's Google or any other organization, um, you're absolutely just going to want to always keep this inclusivity lens in mind. It's going to be really important for any company. Okay, let's. Um, I see people coming in saying hello, so thank you for being here. Um, as always, uh, we like to get down to business really quickly. Just a couple of agenda items, which is um, I think you all know, practiceinterviews.com. We have a ton of free resources. We have a free desktop app, so log into our platform uh, and you'll have access to that app and, and we're going to be playing around with that quite a bit. All right, so let's dive in. Uh, the last comment is we love questions, we love comments, we love data. Uh, the goal of the community is to share information that we think would be helpful. So um, we're going to dive in and I'm if you just hopped on again, I'm in Maui. It's a little early, so I'm going to try and uh, get the cobwebs out and, and uh, and we can get down and get some questions answered. So thank you so much. All right, let's dive right in. Okay. Ooh, I like this question. What does a typical reload package look like and how it and how negotiable is it? So what these bigger companies will do is they're they're gonna offer you a relocation package that's it's usually decent. I've never seen, I haven't seen a lot of like amazing reloads now. There are some unique one-off cases where you might be an executive and you might get a great reload. But um, like at Google, if you're going to do the reload thing, essentially what that looks like is um, you have two options. The first option is, is that they're going to pay you just basically what's like a bonus. They'll say, hey, do you want to cash out on your reload? And that's the option. Remember anything, reload bonus, sign-on bonus, they all get taxed very very heavily it's taxed like a bonus and then the other option is a point system so you're going to be a lot of a certain amount of points they'll help you work with a reload coordinator and you'll choose something like temporary housing or moving expenses etc these are some of the items um, that would be offered so that's what the relocation package looks like typically my recommendation to, for anybody looking at a reload is the cash out's usually not a great option I really want you to run the numbers. Like for Google, for example, that temp housing can be a huge benefit because you may be moving to a new market, well, you are moving, uh, that you don't know that well. So maybe you're moving to the Bay and you don't know it that well. Take the temp housing. It's a really good bang for your buck. And you'll get to figure out like how close do you want to live to the office? Can you afford living close to the office, et cetera? So I love the temp housing piece. That's kind of one of my favorites. But um, obviously if you're a homeowner, helping you with closing costs. Um, maybe you have a big house and you need to move a lot of stuff. Those are some options as well. Um, the relocation stuff's interesting. Just play around with it. Do not just accept the cash out on a reload. 
That's the most important thing. If you're thinking, I don't have that much stuff to move, et cetera, just think through it, go through the process, and the process will really help you determine what's going to be the best for you from a reload perspective. Hope that helps. Okay, two-part question. What is your experience on making a person whole during the relocation process? What does it mean if I get an offer, have to move, and I would have to sell a house? And then the second part is close to a retail store and deal with existing inventory, which would be at a hard cost. Okay, so this is back to the reload question. Yeah, I mean, any of these items, just remember, whether it's Google or any of these big tech companies, they're always considering market conditions. But yeah, this is this is relocation. This is actually a really important concept for us to talk about. If you're considering reload right now, we're in one of the probably maybe the hardest time to ever relocate. Housing inventory is super low. Um, the housing market is as competitive as it's ever been. So this is really, really tough. Um, so, yeah, this is a, a tricky question, and hopefully they're factoring in market conditions. But typically, in anything, when they're doing kind of like this comp review or reload review, it's not happening monthly. It's maybe quarterly, biannually, annually. So um, reload may not be adjusting for current market conditions. Hope that helps. Is the flow of interview differ for candidates? Initial system design, coding, RRK, GNL. Yeah, actually, this is a fantastic question. The flow can be super different depending on the role. Um, sometimes the flow is, is straight up availability. Um, so somebody's available to do one type of interview earlier. Uh, it's they're, they'd like to follow a certain methodology, but I've found that even with the roles where they like to do the GCA and RRK first or GCA and Googliness and leadership first, um, sometimes they'll break the mold just because they can get the right interviewers in at the right time. Now, interviewers should be nimble. They should be able to do um, multiple types of interviews, but it just depends on the group. So yeah, there's no typical flow. The only one that's pretty straight up is a lot of these uh, roles will obviously have that first interview, which is, they don't really call it anything, but it's typically like an RRK. It's as close to an RRK as you'll get. So um, that's a great question. It really hops around quite a bit. Okay, back to Relo. Okay, I'm, I'm liking Relo today. We can talk a little bit about this. Depending on the company and level, some offer closing costs towards the purchase of a new one. Okay to inquire in the details if you get an offer with what you cover and working with the hiring recruiter can get some insights into the benefits and details okay so this is somebody this is somebody sharing some feedback um so just really important that you get your data gathering i mean the reload stuff it's so important just get the information um you know that's really basic basic advice but Let's just take all the data points, and then once you have all the data points, consider. I work with a lot of clients who say, hey, I'm just going to take the lump sum for Relo, and I say, hold on. Let's just let's just get all the data first. It's going to be super valuable. Yes, we are in Hawaii, so um, I, used to, I used to live here um, in, in Maui. I'm specifically in Kihei, where I used to live with my wife, and... It's a little early, so um, I'm getting out the cobwebs, and, and we're going to have some fun today. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Okay. I'm ready for the next round, which is GCA. My question is, if you succeed in the first round, what weightage? Oh, do the next round have? Okay. So basically, at almost all these companies, right, um, there's typically not a lot of weighting. Now, like, if you're an engineer and you go in and, you can code and you do the system design and the behavioral is not quite as good. Okay, well, we're going to rely on the coding and system design and maybe say, okay, the behavioral was good, but it wasn't perfect. But really, that, it's not the way it works. Um, there's not waiting going on in these interviews. Uh, typically, all the interviews count equally and you have to do well in all of them. You could obviously have an interview that doesn't go well and still make it through the process. Um, and again, this can be very different organization to organization. There are some organizations um, that really focus in on, hey, you got to crush every interview. I can tell you specifically at Google, that's not the case. 
Oh, love the emojis. Thank you. Okay. Okay. What would be the best certification for someone targeting an account executive role at Google GCP? Yeah. So for anybody going after GCP, and this let's let's cast a wider net here for anybody not going after Google roles, GCP, AWS, Azure, any of these big big cloud providers. Any sort of certification is going to be helpful. Like the more robust certifications are great because foundationally having that knowledge will make you much better in the interview, specifically on open-ended questions. But I just, I really like having that data, having that knowledge. Like, I don't think you should go into these GCP interviews without having some sort of knowledge gain or some sort of knowledge basis because uh, the competitors are having it. And like, I just as an, as our audience should know, like when I work with clients, the vast majority, um, obviously these are people who are very committed to the interview process, but they're, they're doing the work, right? They're putting in the time. So, um, just something to know. Others who have interviewed for or started as Google cloud, Tam, I had a screening interview with a Google recruiter this afternoon for a TAM role. And he said that starting on 9-1, Google TAMs are required to live in the city where Google has an office. Part of Google's plan to have employees in office and on-site three days a week. Um, let's see. If others been told this requirement, in my case, he said, if I was hired, I would have to move to a city with Google Office by 9 months. Okay, so what we're seeing is, is that Google is ideally targeting 9 one um, And again, this is just coming from my internal internal resources, internal friends at Google. Uh, Google's targeting 9-1 uh, to be back in the offices. I think it's, I think it's a little aggressive. Um, they're probably going to come up with some sort of plan, like maybe you can only be in the office if you've been fully vaccinated or something like that. But they're targeting 9-1. I still believe that it won't be mandatory. And I've, I've kind of heard hints of this, that it won't be mandatory to be back in the office until the beginning of 2022. Uh, but something we just need to keep a pulse on uh, just to make sure that um, we're getting that data. But that's what I'm hearing too. And being in a, being in a specific location, like Google's not the most friendly company when it comes to working from home. That's just not the way they work. Um, they like you in the office. And uh, if you can be close to an office and you don't have to relocate, the perks are amazing. The food, the free gyms, all the stuff that they offer is amazing. So they want you in the office though. They're not going to lean like some of these other companies that are totally open to you um, to be remote. I hope that helps. Hey, Jess. Google Recruiter said eight to 10 candidates are going for my role. And one, is that a boilerplate response? And two, how many folks get whittled down throughout the interview process and steps? Um, I'd say that that's definitely not a boilerplate answer. Um, if they're giving you specific numbers, it means that um, they're trying to just give you some visibility into the process. Now, if if they just came out and said that, I would think that that would be a little strange. But if you ask them, um, that would definitely be a question that I would answer for my candidates. Like, what's the what's the downtick of sharing that information? Right? We always knowledge is power, and recruiters want to share that information with the candidate. So, um, yeah, it probably is eight to ten. Where they get whittled down depends. I mean, if eight to ten people crushed the phone interview they'll take eight to 10 people through the process. They're not gonna say, okay, we have too many people. No, they'll take everybody through. Cause let's say, let's say eight to 10 people, including you just crush the interviews. Like everybody crushes it. We'll try and find homes for you guys. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to get through the interview process. So um, don't worry so much about the competition because that's a non-control item. You can't control it, but you can control how you perform. But yeah, everybody's awesome they're really going to try and find like or similar roles for you. And remember, at any of these big companies or most companies, they have a really good ATS system. The data sticks with you. And even if you did good and somebody else did a little bit better, well, they're going to have that awesome data on you. And what that means is that they're likely to revisit your candidacy in the future. So um, think about it holistically. Um, and I hope, I hope that helps. 
Okay, two-part question. You're interviewing for an SEDD role. Okay, you had your last on-site interview today, hiring manager around behavioral and leadership questions. However, I was a little surprised to give the request to give another interview. Okay. Um, at the end, and I was told that they would like to have another coding system design interview while I already had one and got positive feedback. Why again? Okay, this is um, this is actually... I think that this, let's take this as a positive um, because if they're requesting another one, what they probably wanted to confirm was the coding interview was probably good. And so the hiring manager probably wanted to hop on with you, um, see how you did, see how much the hiring manager liked you. And even though it was good, it's probably like they just want a little bit more of a signal. So what this probably means is that your interview today went well, your past coding interview went well too but they just want to get a little bit more data. So take this as a positive. All the good things that you did in the last coding interview, do them again. I want you to do the same stuff because if you do the same stuff, um, you'll have a positive result. But this is a trigger. This means that the hiring manager liked you, liked what you said. Um, so yeah, I think that this is a good sign for you. Just, you know, it's tough in this interview process when we we think we're at the end of the process and we have to do more interviews, but more interviews typically means there's enough of a signal to keep going. Um, so it, it is a positive and good luck and come back and let us know how things are going. Okay. The two positions at Google closed due to restructuring. Is this common or are they just trying to see if I can navigate ambiguity? Second round interviews with team number four tomorrow. Okay, so Tina, yeah, you're you're just falling in one of those areas where it's just a little bit of bad luck, right? Like, it's not really bad luck. It's just it wasn't the right opportunity for you at that time, right? But yeah, this this kind of like um, restructuring or loss of headcount, totally not uncommon. It is uncommon that it happens a couple times, but it's something that I've seen happen to other people. So you just got to roll with it. Um, it sounds like they like you. And, and the, the key to that is that they keep asking you to come back in and interview. So um, again, focus more on the fact that they're trying to keep you in the process. Uh, and I hope that helps and good luck and let us know how it goes. Yeah, I love the positivity, you got it. Okay. All right. Um, do hangout on six take all place in one day or across a few days? Okay, so let, this is this is a fun thing to talk about. Um, ideally, they're shooting all for the same day, but they just have a much, it, they can be much more flexible now because everything's virtual or it's gonna be virtual obviously for the next at least few months. So here's what I'm recommending. And to anybody who's watching right now, my recommendation is for virtual on sites, tell your, Tell your recruiter, you know what, I'm really flexible. So if you need to break it over a couple of days, I'm totally okay with that. Here's why. Uh, all the science and data backs that our brain can only take on so much in any given day. So with interviews, being able to break it up over a couple of days can be super impactful. You might get a miss in one of the interviews where you can go back and get some learnings, um, maybe between that day or days. So the target and goal is to get it all done in one day. But I'm seeing a lot of times that's not happening. That's not happening. And actually, this is one of the biggest advantages of virtual interviewing is that you can have your interviews broken up. Because when you have to do three or four all back to back in one day, it can just be incredibly exhausting for your brain. Um, and some people's brains work better in short spurts. And some people's brains uh, are, are better at that long kind of path. But um, I hope that helps. But yeah, it's, it's whatever the scheduling and works for the scheduling. Good luck. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you had a great interviews with four people for a role on Thursday and Friday last week. You've reached out to the people who interviewed me here on LinkedIn and three of them have responded and connected with me, but I haven't heard or received. Let's see if we can get the second part of your answer here. All right. So the second part didn't come through, but you, it sounds like probably you haven't heard back from the fourth one, um, and I think that's okay. I'm going to actually throw this back to you and see if we can get a little bit more data. Um, the fact that even a few of them connected with you is 
Um, that's not always common, so good luck. Okay. Share GCA interview questions, example, related to GCP roles. Okay. So, you know, the most common question um, that's coming up in the cloud GCP roles is open a pastry shop. I mean, that is hands down the most consistent one. Um, I'll pin a video in the timestamps, um, or sorry, I'll pin a I'll pin a link in the timestamps to that video. But open a pastry shop is hands down the number one. From everything I can tell, they haven't put that one to bed. Maybe if they find my video, they might. But um, even recruiters internally have been referencing that one to clients, and that's such a good one to work on because it will really help you foundationally understand how you clarify, build a framework, and ask and, and get into that solution for something completely random. Um, so that's one that I've seen coming up for GCP. Uh, that's one that I think would fo really focus on. I've seen the um, help your friend open a bicycle shop. That one's also an opening a shop one. I want to stretch you. I want you to just even look around your room that you're sitting in right now. It's like I'm, I have this lamp next to me. It's like build a lamp. Why is why can we make that a GCA question? Because if you tie that back to the role, well, would you actually build, be the builder of the lamp? No, but you might be the person who collaborates to make sure that that is the most technologically advanced lamp that's ever been out there. How do you work with GCP to use AI and ML to make sure that that's the best lamp that's ever been created and that lamp is learning you and your habits when you come into the room, when you leave the room. These GCA interviews, it, it's, it's less about the question and more about do you understand and have you prepared pre-planned clarifying questions? Are you comfortable with a couple of frameworks? And are you ready to solve based on what the role is asking? Because if I start throwing out GCA questions, it's, it's less helpful than building those foundational items. Those foundational items will help you crush any question no matter what it's going to be. Um, we're going to try and build in uh, more of like a GCA questions into our question bank, but that's just coming in, coming probably this summer. I hope that helps. And keep us updated. Good luck with everything. Yeah, so, okay, so position is on hold. There's been some restructuring. These are common things. The most common one is the on hold one. Um, and so when you have this kind of instance with a recruiter, what you really want to ask them is, what's the cadence? How often can I be reaching out to you and, you know, just, just checking in with you? Because that's going to be the most important when something gets put on hold we have no idea if it's going to come back or not. So we just kind of ask our recruiter, hey, can I check in with you once every day, once a week, once a month? Like, what does that cadence look like? Because you really want to build the strong relationship with them. Um, and obviously, if during that time you can pay it forward, like you can send them other candidates or other people that might be helpful, that is going to be huge too. Just continue to push and drive and add value. I hope that helps. Okay, over two days. Uh, again, pretty common for a virtual on-site. I'm going to say that it's actually more common now to probably have it split than have it all in one day. It's just, it's much, much easier for the recruiting coordinator to schedule it over multiple days. And that, again, is an advantage for you. I know it can be a little bit stressful with work and trying to fit it into your calendar, but trust me, it's, it's a huge advantage. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. My recruiter asked me to share two to three internal references to whom they'd send a Google reference letter. What is the significance of an internal reference in that letter? Would it hurt if I have none? Um, so, no, it definitely does not hurt. Let's see the second part of your question. Um, the recruiter also asked that I share my current compensation details along with supporting documents before submitting. Is that mutual? Okay, so let's go back to the first question. So two to three internal references. It does not hurt you to not have internal references. And I think we talked about this last week, pretty sure. 
uh, don't play around with the internal references. Like if you really, if you like know Bob from three years ago and you kind of liked each other, don't do it. Um, you really need to be careful with internal references. I have single-handedly had to reject, or I single-handedly had to reject um, candidates at Google because they submitted an internal reference and that person gave bad feedback. And I was not allowed to say anything and nor will any recruiter be able to say anything to you. So what does it sound like? Sorry, we're not going to be moving forward with the process and they can't give you any additional information. So just be really careful on internal references. If you don't know anybody that well, just don't provide any. So on current compensation details, um, remember that this is really driven by the market. So um, depending on where you are, uh, sometimes we're asked to provide this information. So if they're asking you to provide supporting documents, um, then chances are you're in an area where they can specifically ask for your current compensation information, which, you know, obviously in a lot of places in the U.S., they just can't do that. Now, some, some, some states in the U.S., they can, of course, but um, if they are actually asking for supporting documents, you're probably in a location where they're allowed to ask for it. And in that case, you don't have as much negotiating power. Um, now, you can always say on the, on the compensation side and just not give them information. I have clients do that all the time. That's my recommendation, not to give any information on the compensation side. But again, in certain markets, you're just going to have to give it. So if you want to come back and just let us know what the market is, that would be helpful. Thanks. Okay, so Slack info, Europe is targeting 9-1 for being in the office, even for cloud engineering roles. Okay, so we're definitely, definitely hearing that it's gonna be 9-1. Um, and this, again, this may not just be Google, this could be other companies too. I just, I guess my answer to that is I'll believe it when I see it. Like, I think that, that there could be some pushback for being in the office 9-1 and maybe just a little bit too soon. And, and trust me when I tell you, Google or any of these big companies is going to take the, the employee feedback very strongly. So I think targeting is the word we really want to focus in on. Let's pretend this is an interview and focus in on that significant word. They're targeting 9-1. But they don't know where things will be as of 9-1. Obviously, we've seen variants of COVID, um, and we've seen some outbreaks, unfortunately, really sad outbreaks in countries like India. And so, uh, you know, it's just something that we'll have to be tracking and monitoring. I'm going to say right now, I think it's going to be 1-1-2022. Um, but I'm obviously not the ultimate decision maker on that. Um, but just know that that 9-1 that date might flex. Okay, how much time does it take after the completion of a GCA leader, leadership and Google News interview to get results? An idea so you can plan accordingly. Okay, so, so ideally five business days is, is typically pretty average amount of time to actually get feedback. Uh, I think internally, I don't know what the, what the timeline is now. Um, when I was there, it was 48 hours. And, I've rarely had all my interview feedback in 48 hours. I think it's probably something in the 48 to 72 hours. I just build in a little bit of that contingency, say five days, and just know that you could have an outlier interviewer. It takes a long time. And remember, the recruiter is going to be pushing on that person and really poking that person, especially when it gets to be about five business days. I would start massively harassing interviewers um, and pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, so I would expect a foul week. I hope that helps. Okay. Does the interview with the hiring manager weigh more than others? Are they equally important when it comes to hiring committee? They're equally important. Here's the one thing though. Let's let me let me just switch it up because I tell everybody they're they're that they none is more important than the others. And when it comes to hiring committee, that's true. But remember, the hiring manager will also be writing your statement of support. So. If all the other interviews were good, but the hiring manager interview was like decent, maybe the statement of support is not going to be quite as good. Uh, but uh, we're not going to worry about that. Um, it's it's not a big deal. Typically, the interviews it's equal. So um, yeah, 
just crush it in all the interviews and you'll do great. But the hiring manager, again, if you're in one of the, the majority of roles will have hiring committee, right? And so they'll write a statement of support on why they support hiring you. And usually, even if that interview wasn't killer, um, they're going to have enough other data to say, okay, yeah, we should absolutely move forward. So I hope that helps. But yeah, it's, it's pretty useful. Okay. What is the ideal answer for why you should be hired? The interview is text-based. Should you talk about your personality, your experience, or your knowledge about the job? Okay. So for the why question, um, you should talk about three things. For why the job, there's a few items I like to really highlight. First of all, if you get why this company or why you, one minute or less, um, we really got to keep those answers pretty short. And again, I'll, I'll add a link to the a video that I did on this. Um, so that's one. Rule of three is two. I really like to mention three specific concepts. And so the three specific concepts for why. Um, so these change a little bit depending on the question. If it's like, why you? Then you're going to focus on three items that are key skills and strengths. If it's why the company, then you'll want to talk about one area of the company that you really like and enjoy, something maybe about their culture or environment or something like that, then one strength, and then one thing that's very, very role specific. So if it's why you really strength, strengths based, and then if it's why the company, we're gonna bring in a little bit of the company element as well. I hope that helps, and I will definitely add a link to the video I did on that. Okay, so, so sure, and despite hiring manager asking you to go through another coding, the recruiter is being proactive in collecting all the information to move to hiring. Um, that's weird. Yeah, I don't know why they would ask for another interview, but also data collect to move to hiring committee. So what I mean by that is I just, I want you to, I want you to stay laser, laser focused for that coding interview. Okay, whatever you got to do to get your head right, even if it's fundamentals or foundations or whatever you need to do for that coding interview, don't don't even listen to what that recruiter said. I want you to imagine that they didn't tell you that. Let's erase that from our memory, and I want you to go in and crush that coding interview. Okay, so focus in on the interview first. First things first. Again, I don't know why they would give you that messaging. So go crush that coding interview. Make sure that they have every reason to hire you. Okay, good luck. Going into a second round interview with Google for a sales position, you're welcome. Good luck. Um, those sales roles, you could get um, just, just something that I saw from a couple of my sales clients. You could get really really basic questions in those for those sales positions go into our question bank i think for for like a enterprise sales rep we have a pretty pretty good practice questions but one of my clients got like it was how do you close a deal how do you structure a deal how do you win the deal really really short and basic questions like that so be prepared for those kinds of questions again cfs method for those questions And is it possible that the interview round will be more than four rounds for Google? Yeah, no, not not for sales roles, not typically. Um, they've, I've seen them get as narrow as three interviews for these roles. They're doing a really good job on law of diminishing returns and understanding that they shouldn't over interview. It depends. Yeah, it depends. It could be, it, it, it also could be a data point. Like sometimes they just want a little bit more data. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, but I've seen I've seen as few as like for like a FSR role. I've seen as few as three interviews. Um, so you shouldn't get over interviewed for this position. I hope that helps. Okay, Earl. Four parts. All right. Everything was brilliant. With my process at Google and the team managed. But the recruiter asked me for transcripts. I'm studying a master's and there's one year left with perfect grades. But suddenly everything went down. She called me the next day and told me I'm not moving forward. Of course, she gave me a generic reason when I asked for feedback. 
that actually focus on problem solving and coding and gave the most optimal solutions. You think that the process stopped because the masters may be the it's not good that they saw that as she recommended to apply again two months before finishing. Okay, so let's go back to this number one. So everything was brilliant with my process. I even had a team match, but the recruiter asked me for my transcripts. Okay, Earl, you know, my one question would be, so the recruiter asks for your transcripts, which is usually a signal that you're at the end of the process. Um, was there any miscommunication with where you were at in your master's program? Like anything that on your resume, it said master's, for example, but you hadn't actually completed it. This is something, um, please come back to us because sometimes there's a slight miscommunication on the education. I saw this actually happen. This is a true story. Um, somebody did not write down their master's education correctly. This happened to a close friend of mine and a colleague at Google. They didn't write it down correctly. This person sold their home, quit their job, and literally they were at the airport. I can't make this up. And my friend had to call them and tell them that Google was rescinding the offer because they had listed education and they hadn't really clarified whether they had completed it and they had not and Google removed the offer. I mean, you can imagine what this did to that person's life. So um, just make sure that it's just a good note to everybody when we're writing down education that it's really clear. I'm not saying that's the case. Please let us know um, what happened there. But it also could have just been they found somebody who they felt was a stronger fit. Sometimes that just happens. And so if there's a cue that they want to reach it back out to in a couple months, that's probably the most likely case. So that story I just told probably doesn't apply to you. I think it's just a good and interesting story. But yeah, if they're coming back in two months, they probably didn't see anything that was really truly a flag or two months before you finish your education. Um, it's a weird scenario. Data is really tough because they're protecting themselves from a legal standpoint. And that's why we just don't get a lot of data and information. Um, good luck with everything. Um, let us know if maybe there was any confusion about the master's program. It doesn't sound like there was there. Is it beneficial in to play? The, is it beneficial coming from a competitor for a Google business role interview and interviewing from an Amazon subsidiary ingrained in customer obsession? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously, yeah, the competitiveness, like if you're coming into a cloud role, and even if you're not like, yeah, if you're not technically at Amazon, but you've been working like with AWS, I just think it's such a huge advantage. And and obviously don't worry too much about the terminology coming from other companies. People worry about mentioning AWS or saying I used PowerPoint for the presentation. Nobody's gonna get upset about that. And they really, really shouldn't get upset about that. So um, I think it's super helpful. I think having knowledge in the space it just having that lens just helps you have so much more success in the interview. So um, yeah, I would say it's an advantage. But, does, Google, does Google typically contact your references? I was asked for three before on sites and how much do these wag? So I don't really know what's going on with the references. When I was there, um, we were doing references for all levels and then they dropped off and then they were only doing references for higher levels. Um, I think sometimes they're contacted, sometimes they're not contacted. It's, it's weird. I mean, the best way to know is to really reach out to your references and, and see if they've been contacted. And that's a good, just a good messaging for if you are in the job interview process and you are providing references, I think that this is common knowledge, but I'm not 100% sure. Definitely be letting your references know that you they will likely be reached out to because people don't like surprises and maybe they're like me and if they see a random phone number, like they just won't answer it. So you can kind of tell them, hey, be expecting it. Again, I know that's common knowledge, but I, I hope it's helpful. Um, so the answer is maybe, maybe not. I hope that helps. Okay, sure. You got an update? Okay. 
On the update from the hiring manager, I mentioned there will be three questions in the GCA round. As for each question, I would have 15 minutes. How to stretch and elaborate each answer. Okay, so what we're seeing commonly for anybody going into these GCA interviews at Google is that um, we're seeing a huge lean um, towards three questions and one being behavioral. So uh, if we're going to cast the wide net, let's just let's just for safety purposes cast that net. Um, you're likely to get um, one behavioral. The behavioral question is going to be something basic. It's not going to be something specific like how do you tell me about a time you enhanced a complex project or um, tell me about a time you had a successful successful initiative, something like that. It's going to be pretty broad. Why? So that you can provide your answer and then they can ask follow-up questions. The more nuanced the behavioral question, the trickier it would be for them in a GCA. Why ask a behavioral question in a GCA interview? Because it allows them to just ask follow-up follow questions and probe on your background. Now, on the open-ended side, if it's three questions, then one's probably going to be random. Think open a pastry shop, and then one will be more role-specific. How would you help a customer enhance their business by utilizing Google Cloud? Something like that. That's typically what it looks like. Uh, I did have a client recently that got asked two behavioral questions in their GCA interview. Um, they are definitely an outlier. That's not very common. Um, not something that I would recommend at all for a GCA interview, um, but it did happen. So good luck. But that would that's me setting the expectations. Okay, Ivan, another part of your question was cut off. Sure. Um, so you asked the question about four interviews. The interviewers went great and reached out to all the interviewers on LinkedIn. And it got cut off again. Um, so Ivan, I'll have you come back. So the question is, you reached out to all four of your interviewers on LinkedIn afterwards. I believe you heard back from three and maybe not the four. Um, just to even get connected with three is uncommon. Um, yeah, LinkedIn really cuts these messages off. So. Um, we'll have to maybe send out a note to let people know that, that LinkedIn is really chopping messages up. Um, but you can come back to us again, please, if you like. Okay. Tiffany, what is the policy for sharing interview feedback after getting a rejection? In a handful of times for GBO, gotten some direct feedback from a nice hiring manager, but just generic from the recruiter. So basically, it's legality. Right. If I give you some sort of very specific feedback, you could record that conversation or you could take that and you could potentially sue Google or sue any of these big companies uh, and potentially win the case. And so that's why recruiters rarely give specific feedback. The only time that they're technically allowed, and I don't even know, honestly, if they coach this at Google anymore, but if you don't meet a minimum qualification. So for instance, I recruited software engineers for a year and the role were required in Python. And they literally did not hit the minimum qualification of being able to code at the right level in Python. I could say, look, your coding skills were not where they needed to be. So that's very specific information and feedback because it's a minimum qualification. But most of the time they won't do it. Now, sometimes you'll get a little bit of insight and that's helpful, um, but it's just, they gotta protect themselves a little bit and remember, if your recruiter gave you direct information and it ever came back, they lose their job. Um, and I know that that's really tough because we definitely want feedback. And I've been in these scenarios too, where I interviewed, I didn't get the job and I wanted feedback, but um, you're just hoping that you get somewhere, somewhere along the process and you get somebody nice to share some information with you. But yeah, this is unfortunately pretty common. Yeah, yeah, that's that's why. That's why you're being asked for that information. So you just need to go ahead and provide it. And remember, um, if you happen to be paid pretty low for the current market, that's okay. Google's not gonna just bring your offer all the way down because they see that information. They're still gonna give you what they believe is a very strong offer. Now, just because, let's say for example, you're currently making 50K a year, Google offers you 100K a year, it still doesn't mean that you can't negotiate. We can always negotiate. So what would be the power for negotiation? 
you're really happy with your current job, you weren't looking to leave, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there can be reasons to try and push and get a little bit more. So don't believe that just a pay stub means we can't negotiate. We can always negotiate. Will we get more? We don't really know. Um, but it's something just that I want you to keep in mind. Hope that helps. Okay, so Tiffany, I believe we just answered that question. So um, let me make sure that you just let me know if you didn't hear that. Okay, you're not able to find any info on upcoming interviewers. Is it okay to ask? Is it okay to not ask personalized questions? They usually allow me to ease into the conversation and point to reference. Okay. Um, so sometimes we won't have data on our interviewers. Don't let it bother you. You've really got to focus in on yourself. Um, I also would say like the warmups, if I was interviewing you, I wouldn't give you any chance for warmups. My most common entry into an interview, I mostly did GCA interviews. I think nobody would be surprised by that. Um, I would say, hi, Tina, nice to meet you. I hope you're having a good day. Okay, let's dive in. I'm going to ask you a really hard question. I'm here to support and help you through the answer. So I wouldn't really give you the warm and fuzzies. And so creating like really specific personalized questions, especially in the beginning, not every interviewer is even going to give you that chance. And even at the end, what do you like the most about the job? What do you like the most about working at Google or whatever company you're interviewing for, right? Like, we're just gonna ask them those questions anyway. I think sometimes having knowledge and data on the personal stuff of our interviewers isn't great. We wanna know their backgrounds, but it, it's definitely not critical for success. I hope that helps. Okay, so examples of GCA questions for marketing and social roles. Um, for marketing and social roles, you could, uh, you could get an emerging markets question. So for a marketing role, um, Google wants to, Google wants to market X products in an emerging market. How would you go about it? That's a, a relatively common, um, GCA question for these types of roles. Again, foundationally. I don't get a ton of clarity into all the GCA questions and they can be they can be relatively role specific, but I would just tell you, have a plan. Like if we all went into GCA interviews and we said, okay, regardless of the question, I'm gonna ask these three clarifying questions. I'm always gonna go in with some sort of operational framework like goals and objectives, risk, scope and scale, stakeholders. And then I'm always gonna solve wearing the marketing hat social hat as I answer the question, it's a game changer. The questions themselves don't matter as much as your prep going in. I could give you all the questions in the world, but if you don't set those clarifying questions, the frameworks and, and get into that frame of mind of answering from a role-based perspective, it's not going to be super helpful. That's just me getting around the fact that I don't I don't have all the questions. Um, but you know, I think maybe an emerging markets one would be a good one to try or focus on. I hope that helps. Okay, good. Content changes lives. Awesome. Did for you. Your question is looking five years ahead and beyond. Does coding boot camp help non-tech transition into technical? Which coding school do you like? Oh my goodness. There are so many. Um, you know, the one that we get really positive feedback, and you've probably seen it, is um, Interview Kickstart. Uh, that seems to be one that's really good. Uh, I believe the last time I checked, it's about $6,000. Um, it's really, I, I believe that they have a pretty good reputation. You'd have to go and look, but that's the one I'm the most familiar with. Um, it just depends on your plan, right? And I think the other piece is, if you're really looking five years ahead, you are gonna get so much good knowledge and data from people internally. So continue to ask the question, especially if you wanna gain your technical skills, ask other people what they've done, how they've been successful. Cause that's gonna be, that's really gonna lead and guide you. I'm this non-technical guy who's giving you advice to go to this platform that you yeah, have connected with a few people on that platform, but I don't know it super, super well. So. Definitely from the source, people who have taken specific courses and actually done the work themselves is gonna be really valuable. But I like that you're already thinking about it. 
just build those strong connections internally and they'll help lead and guide you where you need to go. I hope that helps. Okay. Okay, Earl, you're a master's student. Yeah, we just briefly for the audience, we briefly covered this question, but um, Earl had a rejection and he's part of the master's program and we're just trying to figure it out. So <clears throat> just with any kind of education, like if you're not complete, just say where you are in the process. And so <clears throat> remember credits are not great. Like where I went to college, one credit was one class. I went to a small school at some of the bigger schools, four credits is one class. So credits are not good. You literally say, if you're in like an undergrad program and you've taken 18 of 32 courses or whatever it's gonna be, we wanna be as specific as possible on our resumes, on our LinkedIn profiles. Let's really, let's remove all the guesswork for our audience. And so Earl, obviously it sounds like you definitely did that. My best guess for you is that you were a really strong candidate and then just found somebody who was a little bit better match. And that sometimes that just happens. So the fact that the recruiter wants to stay in touch with you build that cadence even before that two months out of finishing your master's just touch base a couple of times just to let them know that you're still interested and engaged in the role and and good luck is it a bad idea to share how i felt about the on-site interviews via email with my recruiter i felt i dropped the ball in the last one and wanted to assure him i knew the answer uh, and then Meaning, does the recruiter have the ability to sway opinions for me post interview? They do not. Um, and I actually did this once. Um, I interviewed with a startup in San Francisco, and they told me why I wasn't a fit. And I actually sent an email and I said, Well, actually, that's not the right lens. And of course, usually when you send those emails, unfortunately, you never hear back. So, no, the recruiter's not going to be able to sway. Now, if you want to send some sort of gracious and kind thank you and say, I know where I really fell apart and it was this answer and I just want to stay in touch for the future. I think that that's a fine communication, but yeah, ultimately they are not going to be able to sway. So I'm sorry to tell you that, but yeah, that's, that's just kind of the scenario. And I know it feels like, Oh, we just, we, we knew it or we had it. And we just want to share it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's ultimately not going to sway them. You're welcome. Good luck. Let us come back and obviously let us know how those interviews go. Okay. You're specific in your email, quoting the question and elaborating on your answer. Wondering if this would hurt you. Oh, so you sent that email. Yeah, again, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna hurt. It's not gonna hurt you. Um it's just they're not gonna be able to impact or change the process based on the fact that you're emailing information after the interview and it's something that i saw a lot from candidates but it, it, it never changed the answer sorry i hope that helps okay second interview for an account strategist role is this different from the first one you were asked gca behavioral and hypothetical in the first one with the account managers yeah the first one should have actually been more rrk based um so but again, it can always change position to position, but they should really be telling you, um, you really wanna get this guidance from your recruiter on the specific interviews that you're going through. Ask them, because if you were in a GCA interview and asked a behavioral or, and or hypothetical question, that's definitely common now, um, but again, just get that clarification from our recruiters. We wanna make sure that they're making it very clear of where we are in the interview process. Um, we're always, always, always gonna go to the source. Oh, okay, I've been two days going on three. That's very, very common. Um, if you haven't heard back in one week, um, I want you to, one week if you haven't heard back, then we contact our recruiter. Be very gracious, very kind, five business days. And then at the end of that fifth business day, we'll reach out. Hopefully they're being proactive, but we just need to take responsibility. Okay, so Eric, thanks for sharing that. Okay. Okay, so yeah, two business, two or three business days. That's super, super common. Don't worry about it. 
uh, just continue again to be patient and just check in at five business days if you haven't heard that. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, cool. I'm glad these live sessions are helpful. Um, again, I'm in Maui today, so I'm a little, little fuzzy. It's pretty early here, but um, I want to keep showing up for the community. Uh, we love having you guys here, and um, it's, it's super, super fun for us um, to be here and, and be participating, and, and we love giving back to the community. So keep showing up, and we'll keep coming back. Okay, questions we think are not good, but actually are good to ask. Um, I don't know. I don't know questions that we think are not good. I mean, uh, my biggest thing in, in when asking questions in an interview, especially at the end interview, um, is I just, what I don't want to happen is for you to challenge your interviewer. Now, people will totally argue with me on this. Get the job, get the offer, then ask the challenging questions. I see a lot of times people want to come in and say, what is the biggest challenge I'm going to face? What is the most difficult thing? And it's like difficult, like well, we can bring our interviewer down. So warm, fuzzy, fluffy questions. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of flipping your question. I hope that helps. But I, I like the warm and fuzzy questions. I think that those are the best way to go about it. And then if we get the job, we will ask the recruiter, ask the hiring manager to have that conversation, to ask the really tough questions to make sure that we want the job. But we want to get the job. That is our goal. That's why we interview. And then at the end, we can really determine whether it's a good fit. Not everybody agrees with that coaching, but trust me, questions come at the end of interviews. You want your interviewer walking out of there feeling positive every day about you. And sometimes really challenging questions can create a trigger for them and give them a negative impression of you, even though they'll crush the entire interview. Hope that helps. Okay, so you don't recommend coding boot camps, so I thought, okay. Um, okay, so Eric is providing this for anybody who's, um, and I'll throw this, I'll throw this back into the YouTube description, um, but Eric's always our, our go-to person for resources. If Eric says it, just trust it, he knows, okay. How to reach out to FANG recruiters. Okay, so the number one thing you're gonna do when reaching out to FANG recruiters is first of all, if you are going to reach out, identify the appropriate recruiter. The most common reach out I got when I was at Google was about internships. And I didn't hire for interns and it clearly stated in my LinkedIn profile, I hired program managers, software engineers, and customer engineers. Those were the three areas I focused on. So it was very, very clear and it would say, Help me get an internship. It's like, well, I, I'm not going to do that. I would never respond to those. So best way to build relationships with recruiters, see and find the ones that are very active, comment on their posts. And if you reach out to them, provide them with value, article, video. Do not ask them for anything. It's a long game. If you want to build, if you want to build relationships with FANG recruiters, you can't ask them to give you a job. It will not work zero percent of the time so give 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 and it will come back trust me you just got to trust the process it's a longer process to go that way but the other way just won't work so start doing it now reach out by giving article video and really commenting on their activity especially if they're active on LinkedIn. good luck sure Sure, appreciate the knowledge and insight. Trying to remember all of it for each step of the process. Send you to the interview. Um, so I would tell you right now, if I were to go into an interview, I think the open-ended questions would obviously be fine. The behavioral side probably wouldn't be as good. And that's just a good thing to know. To be good in the behavioral side, you really got to put in that prep and practice. And so if you were to ask me behavioral questions now, it would be bad. I mean, I would bomb on Amazon because I haven't taken the time to go back and think through my examples. I'm not actively preparing for an interview, um, which I'm happy about. Um, I love interviewing, but if the behavioral side is something that I want everybody to consider. Oftentimes with my clients, they tell me, I'm good on the behavioral side. I want to focus in on the open-ended side. 
but the behavioral side is lacking due to a lack of prep. So I would not be good on the behavioral side, open-ended side, again, just because of me going back through that process time and time and time again with my clients on a weekly basis, um, that side would be a little bit easier. And again, that just shows the power of practice. Okay, so Ferris, you didn't get any feedback. And I believe you were, yeah, you're, you're, you might never get feedback. You might never get feedback, so you sent that answer into the recruiter. They might never respond to you. Um, I would say don't expect a response, um, especially based on time. The more time that goes by, they might never respond to you. So that's just something that you need to know. I think it's fine that you sent that note, but, yeah, you might never hear that. Um, that wouldn't be uncommon. Um, I had a lot of candidates send me a lot of fixed answers after their interviews, and I would always definitely respond to them, but not every. Just going to do that. Okay, Inspect D, welcome back. I finally received a response from the recruiter after three check ins and was told the company went with another candidate that knew the hiring manager. What can I do to compete as a referral candidate? Um, nothing. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes when there's a previous relationship, it's a known entity. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to rank ourselves against somebody where the hiring manager may or may not have known this person. Like maybe if they were just a referral, they didn't know. But when there's additional data coming in, it's just really, really helpful for the hiring manager to, to get that person hired. Data is data. And so um, I know if I were hiring, that's something I would look for as well. Something to just keep in mind, um, keep trying. Obviously, if you're getting this far in the process, they're going to find another role for you. So just be patient. It's really, really hard to be patient. But trust me, they will come back to you. You will have another chance. I can guarantee it. Anybody that does well in the interview process will have another chance. Mostly the smartest and best sourcers and recruiters at these big companies, they're not sourcing LinkedIn. They're not going to GitHub and, and trying to find people. What they're trying to do is they're trying to source their internal database to find people. Why? Because they already have data on the person. And with you, it sounds like the data is pretty positive. So good luck. Um, keep us updated on how things are going. You've been in the process for an ADP since July of 2020. That's my end. I'm freelancing now and working as a realtor three jobs. Is it necessary to submit a new resume or application to update my LinkedIn? I usually fill people in on relevant parts of my freelance work. Okay. And my LinkedIn is currently optimized for real estate. Yeah, I'm going to say don't worry too much about it. But yeah, absolutely. You could send an updated resume. I think that would be fine. Um, it's, it's, you really want to reach out internally and see if they want any additional data. I don't think it's going to be a huge deal, but it's, definitely something that you can ask them about. Um, I hope that helps. I know it's not a great answer, but um, sometimes when things happen in our career, we just want to, we do want to send that updated resume in. Um, so again, just ask the question and see what they say. It, it may be a yes, it may be a no. Generally, candidates are not comfortable with video interviews, but are performing well on phone interview. What do you recommend for, for those candidates on how to perform well? So, on the video interview, again, I just want us to like understand the positives of the video interview. First of all, no commute. We just go into another room or we go into the same room and we flip on our video camera. There's no stress of commuting. Um, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, is just make sure um, that you're really getting the setup right. Now, is this the perfect setup? No, I'm on vacation and um, I would want the lighting to be a little bit more coming into my face. The background's relatively clean, so clean enough background. I think that's good. The camera angle isn't ideal and perfect for me, um, but it's okay. So we've got to make sure the setup's good, but I want you to focus in on the positivity of why videos are so good. And this is one of the reasons why. Because we can have a pen, we can write down notes, and we can have a little cheat sheet below. 
our frameworks, our clarifying questions, just highlighting the behavioral answer conflict with Bob or successful marketing initiatives. So we have our kind of high level examples written down. We have our frameworks and clarifying questions written down and then it makes it less stressful. So I think we can, we can take advantage of that scenario. Now, I think phone interviews are by far the hardest because we can't read the body language of our interviewer. So we need to look at video interviews as being a huge advantage. And even when we go back to the world where we're going face to face, a company like Google is still going to do some of them via video. You could literally be in a Google office and somebody hops onto the screen in the room. So it's just something you need to get comfortable with. How do you get comfortable? Practice. Practice it with a friend, a significant other, anybody, just to get comfortable being on video. That is a great stopping point for us. Thanks, Tina, for checking in. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. Happy to, to be able to keep this going while I'm in Maui, and, and we'll be back every week as long as people keep showing up. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the lives. Obviously, any comments, feedback, it's always really, really helpful, and we love having you here. Thank you guys so much. Take care.